Hello, everybody. Am I on? Hello. There we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Res Developer Sessions. I hope you've been having a wonderful day. Welcome also to the people on Twitch who are watching us online. A quick note before we begin, there will be some time for questions later. So if you have a question, there will be a microphone placed just in the middle here. Think of something amazing to ask, um, and we'll try and get round to you. But now, without further ado, let me introduce you to Lindsay Murdoch, the design lead of Guild Wars 2, and then Armand Constantine, the narrative lead, and then Clayton Kisco, the episode lead from ArenaNet, here to talk about Guild Wars 2. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming today. It means a lot. Uh, I've talked to some of you, and the, the fans out there that have poured all of their compliments and stuff, is, it feels really good. It makes my day when I get to hear about all that as well. So uh, thanks for coming. We are here to talk about character death uh, more than just a plot device. And we're going to be talking about a specific character death. So spoiler alert, if you're planning on playing episode five, now it might be a good time to scooch out. Um, but I doubt we'll have too many people not surprised by this. Uh, so we'll keep going here. Uh, whoop, sorry. Uh, set this up. We are uh, talking about uh, Aurene and her death. Uh, and why it was so impactful. And I want to play a clip here that shows that moment when it happens. So I'll play it right now. So that is the moment in which Aurene gets taken out, and uh, Lindsay's going to be talking about uh, why, like, how that moment, like, why Aurene is such a special like character, and what that buildup was like to that moment. Yeah, that even just watching it now, it still gives me chills a little bit. I've probably seen it a thousand times, especially through development and and onto live and playing it myself on live, but it's still gets me a bit. <clears throat> I think for uh, a lot of fans, longtime fans of the franchise, Orin's journey really started 14 years ago, the first time they entered Glint's Lair and saw her big cache of eggs and this concept of, oh, this dragon could have children, <laughs> was first introduced uh, in the original game in, in Prophecies. And then <clears throat> we also had uh, later in Eye of the North, one of Glynn's eggs had hatched, and we had to protect that little baby dragon um, from assaulting uh, minions. And uh, we got to see sort of what her offspring might look like, Glynn's offspring looks like. And then later on, many years later, when Guild Wars 2 was released, uh, we had um, no presence in the original game. At that point, Glint had been killed, and uh, there was no... Uh, a remainder of her uh, that we could go visit yet. Uh, <clears throat> but then, over the course of the story, uh, we introduced this egg. Uh, we found out that one of her eggs had uh, survived and was being kept safe by an entire faction of people who were just, their entire life's purpose was to keep this egg safe for some higher purpose, eventually. Uh, <clears throat> and then, so in season two, we get introduced to the egg. The egg is stolen uh, from those people. We go on this chase to try to recover it. We're starting to build momentum for how important this egg is uh, as far back as season two. Then in Heart of Thorns, again, the egg is featured. We bring the egg to a location where we know it will be safe, uh, where it could hatch, potentially. And, and we're building up that, that sense of there is something really important about this, this object. It is, it is special. Um, it is gonna have big, meaningful impact on our world, and we need to keep it safe. Uh, and then in season three is when we really get to 
meet her, she hatches. We get to be there for the moment when Orion hatches and she kind of imprints on you. It's that sort of moment of, you know, are you my mommy? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get to protect her in her first moments of life and, and already you're sort of setting yourself up as, as this protector of Orion uh, and, and how important she is uh, to the commander character, the PC character. And throughout season three, it was really important to us to show um, the bond that you are building with this little baby dragon. Uh, because we knew that in Pathfinder, so the, the folks of us uh, who are working on Living World knew that the Pathfinder expansion team were working on this really big moment when Orin, as a child, comes flying across the world to try to save us because she sees that we're in danger. She knows that we're going to be hurt gravely, and she wants to rescue us because she cares so much um, about that character, about the player character. You've been bonded. And so it was really important for us working on Living World to have those moments where you can bond with her, have moments where you can be teaching her how to be a good little dragon. You know, in, in the world of Guild Wars 2, our dragons are very hostile to uh, mortal life very hostile, and so this is the first time that there's a dragon that you have a chance to sort of redeem. You know, you have a chance to teach her how to be good so that she doesn't turn into one of those like world-ending dragons um, that we're in conflict with. And you start having these moments with her where you know she comes to you and uh, calls to you, and <clears throat> you know in episode three you see little visions of her to like come back, and you get to play hide and seek with her. And there's all these little things that um, that sort of start to build up who she is as a character. And leading into Path of Fire, where there is that big moment uh, where she does try to rescue you. Unfortunately, she's unable to. She's a little baby dragon. <laughs> you know, there's only so much that she can do when faced with a god who's trying to take you out. So um, we really wanted to make sure that that moment made sense and was powerful, and it would make sense for this little baby dragon to come try to rescue you. So we wanted you to be bonding with her. Uh, and that really leads into this season of season four where she is a big major character, um, a big part of the player character's life. Uh, she drives the story in a bunch of different ways, uh, but she's always by our side um, you know, as much as possible. We want those moments. We want that, that relationship to be well solidified by the time we get into season four where we knew big things were gonna happen for Orin. So it was really important to us to develop that relationship, make sure that you feel this attachment to her, you feel this connection with her, feel some companionship with her. We've, we've well developed that she's a person, she's not just a, a little creature. You know, uh, All those things were very, very important for us in her journey and what led us to this season where she has such impact. Yeah, so as we were working on breaking the story uh, for uh, season four, uh, once we had realized that we were building towards this sort of epic conflict um, and the direct con confrontation with Crockett's work and that Irene was not gonna survive it, uh, what was very clear to us was that we had to do this in a way that was gonna make um, that moment feel meaningful and not cheap, uh, which is a challenge. Um, Specifically, it's a challenge because what we're trying to do is build up a character, uh, develop the sense of intimacy that we have with her, um, and kind of, you know, more humanize her. But we're talking about a character who doesn't speak. Right? So um, all through the process of development, the entire team came up with lots of clever and insightful ways to kind of do this in many small ways that um, amounted to a lot. But in the beginning, uh, from a narrative perspective, what we had to do was figure out how we were going to build a series of moments that sort of um, worked under sort of traditional storytelling principles to, to develop this character uh, up until the moment of, of, her, of her death. Um, so for context, story breaking at ArenaNet is highly driven by character. I mean, character is very important to us. I mean, we, what we do is we're developing uh, serialized content, right? And so our writer's room, our writing process is not too dissimilar from serialized television. We have a writer's room, we get in there, we break story on a whiteboard, we're trying to figure out what are the storylines that we're trying to tell over the course of the season. Um, 
articulating the themes that we want to sort of use as touchstones for all the developments along the way. What are the big dramatic turns? Uh, but what we always go back to, and one of the things that drives so much of that breaking process is, you know, how are we revealing character? Uh, what are the interesting arcs that we want to set out for these characters? Um, so, in planning for the story, we use these storytelling techniques to kind of like build toward this moment. So how do you get to know a character better? How do you develop uh, intimacy uh, with the character? One of the ways is to reveal the interior life of that character, right? For a, a character that doesn't speak, you have to find other ways to do that. Um, so you're trying to illuminate fears, hopes, values that that character has, right? So in episode four, one of the things that we did was Aureen had a vision of uh, the outcome of her conflict with, with Krakatori. Um, she basically saw, you know, dozens of visions of the way that this conflict could happen, uh, the battle could go down, and in every one of them, she ended up dead. Uh, we showed her panicking over that and, you know, running away, kind of hiding out. Um, her fear, right? The fear of her own demise. Um, and what was being asked of her? Yeah. Something really, really extreme was being asked of her. Yeah, she's being asked to do the impossible and yep. had to face it, right? Uh, same thing uh, in, in episode five. One of the things that happens is that Kate gets branded by Aureen, and so they develop this very close um, kind of empathetic um, psychic uh, bond, right? And so we have a character who can speak and who can reason, who can see into Aureen's psyche and can tell us about what she sees there. Um, at the beginning of that battle, she says, you know, Aureen is afraid, but she's ready, right? Being able to see a character's hopes and worries and fears and those kinds of things allows us to sympathize with them and kind of builds that sense of intimacy, right? Like players bond with these kinds of things. Um, one other benefit of that relationship between Keith and Aureen was that Keith was able to articulate what it felt like to be in Aureen's mind, right? She describes feeling this sort of deep well of love for the mortal races of, of Tyria. Um, and especially close, for the player character. Yes, this close bond and love for the player character. Um, these things, uh, these moments, they build, and they, they add up to um, a sense of closeness, right? Uh, another thing that we thought about was just developing that relationship between Aureen and the player character, right? Like relationships between characters is very helpful. And so one of the core themes of episode five in its entirety was um, developing the, uh, uh, this partnership or cooperation between Scion and Champion, between Aureen and the PC. Um, that was something that we tried to build into every level of that episode, right? We expressed it every, every opportunity that we could, from Glint's trials in the beginning, where Scion and Champion had to work together to get through those trials, to forging the Dragon's Blood Spears, to the mechanics, moment-to-moment -moment mechanics in the, in the final fight. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is also additive. And then the last thing that we wanted to do was to find a way to make sure that Aureen had a choice in, in what led to her death, right? We get to know who a character is by the choices that they make. Mm -hmm. um, so Aureen went into this episode fearing her own demise, right? Fearing the death that she saw expressed so many ways in the vision that she had of her fight with Kakatori. She was afraid, but she was ready. Despite being terrified of that, the moment came and she stepped in front of Kralkatork to shield us, right? And she did not survive. Um, all of these things together, I think, are... Like I said, there are many other things that, that developed over the course of uh, producing these releases, but in terms of the planning, something that is very collaborative between design and, and the narrative team, I think these went a long way in kind of eliciting the reactions that we saw from fans. Um, when, when the moment came. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Armin was just talking about uh, some of the narrative, uh, how the narrative team built up their character, and he alluded to a lot of the things that game design um, or the designers on the team, uh, the tools they would use to help emphasize those goals of the narrative and, uh, design and uh, leadership. And so we knew we had a couple main guidelines we wanted you know, not to just watch Aureen do cool things. You are the player, you're the commander, so you should be a part of this experience as well. Uh, but at the same time, it is Aureen's story too, in, in ways. So you want to balance it. It's about both of you. 
uh, and we knew that we wanted um, to, of Orion to not just be a pet, we wanted to continue uh, that consistency that we set all the way back uh, you know, when she first hatched. Uh, so we used um, different, different techniques like having her assist in combat, um, you know, she would come and fly in and clear a path for you, and you'd feel like, wow, she's, she's just like Kanak or Logan or Kate, you know, someone on your team, someone who has a role, um, she's doing great stuff, but she's, she's kind of setting you up for the alley-oop, right, where you're coming, you know, she takes the pathway, and you can go and fight uh, the boss. And we also set up uh, different encounters where it was imperative that you and, Re you and Orin work together, like the trials you were mentioning, mm -hmm. um, but also when you're fighting Bathazar uh, in the Path of Fire, uh, and also in Krakatorix, uh, that last fight in episode five, you're working together uh, to channel, you know, narratively you're channeling the energy, um, but really it's, it's you and her interacting together uh, to do something great uh, and bigger than yourselves. Uh, and then, you know, the, the other tool in our toolbox was the prophetic visions. She was, she was a, a really important piece to let you know of like, oh, the, you know, she helped us find the area uh, in episode one of this season, right? She, she show, we got to see through her eyes in episode two where she was able to show us the lay of the land so that we could strategize about how we were going to attack and, and take out the, the inquest and the awakened. Uh, so she was, she was really important, uh, and that relationship was builded um, off these different mechanics and tools we used. And this was, this was about the indiv individual contributors coming up with these different ideas and running them past leadership and narrative. Um, so that was really also a cool thing to see. Um, everybody was on board you know, with, this, um, with this directive, basically. Mm -hmm. um, it was great. We really try to have a very collaborative environment uh, between narrative and, and design and, and really all the disciplines at ArenaNet. And so, you know, great, a great idea is a great idea. It doesn't really matter where it came from. Anybody can have a great idea. And uh, we really encourage people to bring that to us. Yeah. And so uh, a lot of these things that we ended up doing were individual contributors, like Clayton said, coming to us and saying, hey, I think I could get it so that Orene comes and fights in various events around the map. And you could just see her around the map fighting. We're like, yeah, yeah. do it. <laughs> Yeah. So it's yeah. it's really wonderful having that kind of a collaborative environment. You really can let all those best ideas bubble to the top. Yeah, yeah. and having having everybody be a part of like knowing knowing that directive, um, mm -hmm. having people be a part of that, we get really great feedback. There was a moment in um, episode five, chapter one, Sion and Champion, where at uh, in an early prototype, we actually had a skill that you would use to bring Orin over and do an attack, and it felt really cool and it was a neat thing, but we started getting feedback. Well, that actually starts to feel like she's your pet. Your leash, yeah. You're tugging on her leash to come and attack. And so we took that feedback and we started working on her AI. So if she was in a battle for too long or if she just finished up a combat fight, she would come by your side and, and help you take out something that you were fighting. Uh, and that instantly felt more in line with, with what we were trying to accomplish. Yeah. One of the key uh, tools that makes this kind of collaboration work really well is identifying those like core themes and core concepts, core values that you want to build into the sort of overall story of this, of this experience, right? And being able to use those as touchstones, whether it's you know, the design, the art, uh, the narrative beats, you know, being able to sort of identify these very simple high-level elements that you can go back to and make sure that you're, it uses a litmus test for, for the events that you're um, Proposing. With a character like this, it was really important for us to come up with those kinds of pillars for yeah. her, right? Like, like she should have personhood. She's not just a pet, right. right? And so when we're making decisions that make her seem less of a person, like being able to call her around and order her to do things like, hey, fight this thing, right? Yeah. Um, that's taking away some of her personhood. It's taking away some of her agency. And so we, some at times, we would have to sort of rein things back, um, even when they felt pretty good right. in, in mechanically, because it, it went against the core pillars that we had for this character. Yeah. Uh, so the, the sin event uh, is what we were internally calling this moment uh, after that clip we showed earlier, you are staggering uh, through this environment uh, and, you're, and you, you end up in this moment where you see Orin and like your worst fear is met uh, and she is dead. And this wasn't always the case very early on. We, we were thinking this was going to be a cinematic moment. Um, a designer on episode five, uh, put together a prototype of what maybe it would be like if you were actually walking through that in the game. Uh, and so we use that to eventually pitch that to leadership and narrative um, just to get their thoughts on it. And it was really great to see 
the, you know, the, the amazement and like the excitement uh, of seeing that. And um, we'll show you a clip a little bit uh, in a minute, uh, but it speaks volumes to just like being able to even see that in its early phases and, and believing it and, and being like, no, we can make this work this way. This will, this will be great. Yeah, it's another example of, of our collaborative process. This, this moment in particular that happens after the, the cinematic where Orient dies. Um, you know, we had a designer who said, I think I could pull this off. I think I could build this in game and it could actually be really powerful. And so when he brought that to us and we got to sort of experience it for ourselves, you know, um, uh, at, the, at the computer, controlling our character uh, and experiencing it, living through it, rather than just watching, it just, there was so, something so powerful about that that we really wanted to lean in on. And it became this really kind of intensely collaborative process with the cinematics team, with animators, with prop artists, um, narrative and design, reviewing it every week. Uh, the designer who uh, came up with the idea of doing it in a sin event started doing rapid iterations. We were watching videos of it every single week, reviewing it every week, making little tweaks here and there, getting lots of custom animations, um, and, and working with all these different disciplines to try to make it come together in the way that it eventually did, which in my opinion is one of the most powerful moments we've ever pulled off mm -hmm. uh, in the history of the company. Yeah. Um, it's a really powerful emotional moment that very much resonated with fans as well as ourselves. It was hard watching that every week. It was hard working on it. Um, yeah, <laughs> like it was. listening yeah. to Timey cry, you know, I mean, fe giving feedback that makes you feel like a terrible person. Like, I really, I want to hear more of Timey crying. Can we get her <laughs> crying sooner? Like, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. makes you feel kind of like a terrible person. But we wanted that moment to be really powerful, not just for players, but for the characters who are experiencing it as well. It's also a great lesson in how important it is to be able to let go of the initial vision and let things evolve, right? Like, that's, you know, the benefit of, like, having such great collaboration uh, is undermined if you don't let things kind of go. I mean, we, so for the script, right, we wrote the scene, uh, everything that we write on this project is incredibly collaborative, right? We go through a process of drafting and redrafting and then revising in a, in a group, in a room. The writer's room is um, super hands-on and super collaborative. But for the cinematic scenes, it's, it's all the more so, right? We go through uh, drafts until every word is exactly what we want. Um, and we, you know, you're picturing it in a specific way. We were picturing it as a cinematic. We'll so, even record early. So yeah. we'll record many months before we would normally be recording for this episode. We'll record import, important cinematics so that we can hear it with actual voice. Um, so you'll be hearing it in the actual voice. And, and most of that stuff didn't actually end up shipping with the episode. Right. We had to re-record, re um, but we were thrilled to do it. Because once we saw this thing coming together and how good it felt to be guiding your character through this sequence rather than just watching it unfold, we were happy to tackle it again, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, it worked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is an image of some of the earlier uh, storyboards we did. Uh, and if you've played through that moment, uh, you'll recognize that the, the, the core of what we wanted to do and the major beats we wanted to hit was still from there in the beginning and made, it way, made its way all the way to the end. Even though we were iterating every week on this moment, um, we still knew right from the beginning what we were trying to accomplish. And these storyboards, we could kind of put up on the wall and remember like what we were trying to, um, to build to here. Uh, the blocking that we wanted to get to, um, getting to this final shot uh, was a big deal for us and we really wanted to get it right. Yeah, and talking about the iterative process, we were obsessing over the tiniest of details, like oh, right yeah. where that like little rock is gonna be, right, right where that spire yeah. is gonna yeah. be. Yeah, each like, individual little rock, yeah. the lighting, where yeah. every character is Characters, placed, the yeah. way that they're facing, mm -hmm. how they behave in this moment, all of this stuff was very meticulously covered. Yeah, uh, so we'll show you a clip of that early pitch that, we, that uh, our designer had created um, in this next slide here. No, he can't. Someone. Do something. Where is the commander? Here. Alive. Thank the spirits. Boreen? Boreen? Brave. I have to see. Please.
I thought there was a vision, a promise, that we win. What do we do now? I don't know. <laughs> so that's Robo Voice uh, for yeah. everybody wondering. <laughs> it's always great to hear yeah. lines in Robo Voice. Yeah. One of our early development tools allows us to uh, hear in game these lines <laughs> before, well before we get actual voice. Yeah. Uh, so this is kind of like a slide just like highlighting our community and how much they love Aureen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The response to her has been really powerful. Um, players love her. They're very attached to her. And they love making art with her. And, and all different types of medium, um, by all different levels of talent. I think people have really responded well uh, to her character from her inception. That's a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> Aureen's just cute. Yeah. Peggy Twin. Sorry. Uh, and then I'll be setting up basically this uh, clip is the Sin event in its entirety, but with the fan reaction over everything, um, just to get a glimpse of how that moment felt to fans and how that moment impacted them on different emotional states. Peggy Twin. Are you serious? He's just leaving? She's fine.
No, 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 no. Okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> So that was amazing, and the entire team was just watching a lot of them in the moment as it was happening, yeah. and that was personally a career highlight for me. And we were living through those emotions, the, the, the sorrow and the sadness and the excitement, and um, it's really great, and I think this demonstrates just like what it's like to lose a very important character, one that you've grown to love and you have had experiences with, and just what that impact can mean. Um, the me. character you depend on. Yeah. yeah. To save the world. Right. So before we go into questions, uh, we have a little something something to yeah. share with all of you. I'll play it now. Okay, it's that time for some questions. So please queue up and uh, ask your questions if you have some. You monsters, how could you do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah that, uh... So how, 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 I'm interested to know, how long ago did you know that you would one day kill Aureen? Before the season started. Mm -hmm. But that was it, just as the beginning of the season. Yeah. And how did the idea come about? Because I can imagine if someone suddenly said, look, guys, I've had an idea. Why don't we kill Aureen? <laughs> Everyone would be like, what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, it yeah. kind of happened like that a little bit. It was like, you know, we could kill her. <laughs> and, yeah. so, and so how did it go from there? Did, did that kind of excitement ripple through the team? Was it, it, were people immediately on board with it, or was there some pushback? Were some people like, you cannot do that? I think, so our process, like in, when we're, as we're trying to explore the stories that we tell, the thing that takes primacy is being honest about the choices that we make. Yeah. And once this idea had been floated and kind of discussed, like what it means, what, 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 it, what values Aureen represents and what this circumstance would mean for the story, it felt like that was Aureen's story and that it was the truest way to express her her character's journey. And once we realized that, there was no going back, right? The, yeah. the, what takes primacy is tell, telling the truest story that we can about these characters. And so when, when you decided upon it, how did you guys feel about it? Did you feel excited? Did you feel sad? What was the moment where it kind of all came home, I guess? Because you guys have been living with this character, you know, as much as the, 
the people who've been playing it, if not more. I, yeah. I definitely had the same kind of um, excitement that Drawer had as well when, you know, he was like, I'm, I'm so glad we lost. And like, I know, I know that's kind of like morbid to say, but um, winning all the time is a little bit boring. It's a little unrealistic. I know we're in a fantasy world with dragons, yeah. but um, it feels good to have to go through some stuff uh, to just make the, that next part just more uh, accomplishing or to watch a character go through problems. It's, that, it yeah. adds interest. Right, and th that truth in storytelling that I'm talking about, I mean, you have to be open to letting that take you to, you know, victory uh, and also to, to tragedy, right? I mean, you just have to accept that it is going to lead you to places that don't always feel great, but that doesn't mean it's not any less powerful, right? Yeah. Right, because you have that George R. R. Martin thing now, right? <laughs> right. Where everyone's like, oh, God, no character is safe. What's going to yeah. happen? Let's uh, take a first question here. Hello. Cool. Hi. Um, I know we've been discussing Noreen, but I wanted to go back to perhaps narrative as a, in general, if that's okay. Um, obviously, Living World is episodic in nature, and as you mentioned there, there is um, discussions like what we're going to do and so forth. Um, I've done similar in the past, and what I found that during such a process of constantly telling the narrative as you go along, you sometimes make decisions that later down the line you kind of go, oh, I really wish this person was here at this time because I could have paid off in this way. Do you have any stories of like that where you've sort of gone, actually, I really wish we hadn't made that decision. I wish that person had been here now. Hmm. I'm trying to think. I don't know if I have... An example, yeah. Yeah, a specific example doesn't necessarily come to mind, but I, mean, I think it's true that the more you understand the underlying sort of uh, building blocks that you're, mm -hmm. that you're building around, right? Core themes, dramatic premise, like you understand what it is that is going to resonate once you reach the conclusion of a, of, of a, of a <laughs> sequence of episodes, like for us a season, um, then you are creating the hooks that if things do go unexpectedly, you can course correct. The story breaks, but you have the tools to fix it with, right? You can find uh, dramatic turns or uh, new subplots, or new um, storylines to explore that are still, that feel like they are still cohesive, right? And, and that are still meaningful. It, it, so much, at least this is the a very sort of narrative centric, like writer's room version of the answer. Um, if you know what you're doing and you're very thoughtful about it and you are able to articulate exactly why you're making the choices you're making, um, you, have, you have the tools to course correct when those things happen. Yeah, that certainly has happened. It, I think it's often with some weird little thing in the lore um, that we probably said a decade ago. Uh, <laughs> and we, we do our best to not um, uh, retcon the lore. If there's something that we want to do that's a little bit different mm -hmm. um, than what we've said, we try to, to make sure that there is a way that it actually does make sense with our canon lore, even if the canon lore is a little bit odd at times, because there's a lot of people that have worked on this game. Uh, so we, we do try to keep a, a special eye on that and um, make sure that we're, we're doing stuff that makes sense, we're not just retconning. Um, but it certainly has come up from time to time, like, boy, wish we hadn't said that, but <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Um, thank you, and what I would like to state is I do like the fact that you respect what you've written in the past and keep it consistent. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Uh, next question, please. Um, yeah, it was kind of feeding into his point, but to do with timing, so I don't know if you could speak about how timing plays a part in uh, character death as loosely as that as you want. Timing? Timing in what sense? Uh, you mean um, when a character dies, or is there some sort of element to uh, building up trust in the character? And oh, then yeah. when is the crescendo? When if you get yeah, like I mean, we we knew since before the season started that that Orin would die um, during the season, and finding the right time to do that was important. Um, but equally important to us was lining things up. Uh, we like to tell very genuine stories, and we don't like to lie to our audience. We were very direct about what was going to happen, <laughs> right? Yeah. We wanted to make sure that those dominoes were lined up. Much of the season felt internally like we were making sure that all of those dominoes were lined up for this to happen and happen in a way that felt really impactful. Thank you. Yeah. It's like that TV episode, you know, where they start focusing on a character and you're <laughs> like, oh no, oh no, here it comes. Next question, please. Uh, hi. Um, 
so I've done a lot of like narrative structure on my own and you know a bit with obviously teams and that um, over the past like year and a half couple of years but if you're working in like a bigger team how do you um, divide that and make sure you're all sort of like I mean obviously it's good not to be on the same wavelength sometimes because you can bounce ideas but like how do you bring that all together and make sure you know you're not just reiterating and redrafting and redrafting and redrafting like yeah, yeah lots of meetings <laughs> yeah, we, so we, I mean, uh, like I said earlier, the, it, it, it's an extremely collaborative process at our studio. Different people do it different ways, right? Um, our, our process is one that rewards people who believe that a bunch of smart people in a room and working on the same project will make the thing better. And it is punishing to people who want to have authorial control over the thing that gets shipped, right? Um, very... I, nothing, nothing gets shipped that doesn't have the fingerprints of most, if not all, of our narrative department on it, and, and also the fingerprints of our uh, colleagues in other disciplines, right? Um, and we believe very strongly that that it's, our, our releases are the better for it, you know? Um, it's to, to the point that a writer will be assigned to writing the golden path on, on an episode, right? Um, and that first draft will be sort of given feedback on and maybe uh, revised, but then it ends up in a room on a screen with you know, all the narrative team in there, and we table read, and we go through line by line, and we use sort of like, we leverage the, the, a room full of brains to make every line the best that it can be, every scene the best it can be. Um, we're not afraid to say, well, you know, the structure could be better, why don't we go back to the drawing board and fix this? Uh, you have to, we find that we do the best work when uh, there's no ego involved and when we're all on the same page. The thing needs to be the best it can be. Um, and that means that we, everyone who's involved makes it better. Yeah. So even though we do have a, like a point of contact, a main person who's assigned to each episode, everyone works on everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so that, my answer was a very sort of narrative team specific, but it's also true that this sort of iteration of feedback happens with with all the disciplines, right? Yeah, design. Uh, particularly with design. Yeah. Often come up and have ideas and, and questions for narrative, and um, if that starts to get to the next phase, you know, we'll have a meeting about it and mm -hmm. talk about it, and that gets pitched all the way through and iterated on, and um, yeah. Designers are in the writer's room when we're breaking story. Designers Which are, are in one the of the most room fun meetings <laughs> ever. When these guys are witty, <laughs> it's all hell, and it's great. Yeah, there's a lot of collaborative goodwill. I think that's the key. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you guys for coming, but thank you particularly to Lindsay Armand and Clayton from ArenaNet. Thank you. Thanks.